Welcome to the Pituitary Network Association webinar as part of a webinar series. My name is Linda Rio, Marriage and Family Therapist and Director of Professional and Public Education for the PNA. Today we are most uh, pleased to welcome Dr. Nelson Ioscu. I would I'm going to read just a brief description because he has such a, an extensive uh, list of accomplishments, but I do want you all to welcome him. Dr. Ioscu was born in Nigeria. He graduated from St. Gregory's College and received his medical degree from the University of Ibadan. He then went to the University of London in the UK as a Commonwealth Scholar. He served Emory University, Emory Clinic, and the Emory Hospital on a variety of committees, and he's also served on several state and regional committees. He serves on the Board of Directors of the American Board of Neurological Surgery and is Chairman of the Maintenance of Certification Committee. He has recently been appointed to the Residency Review Committee of Neurosurgery. He's a Fellow of the American College of Surgeons and serves on the Board of Governors of the American College of Surgeons and the Advisory Council for Neurosurgery of the American College of, Neuros of Surgeons. He is Chairman of the Match Committee of the so Society of Neurological Surgery. He is ad hoc reviewer for several peer-reviewed journals. He's been president of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons and served on the executive committee of this as well. He has served on the executive committee of the joint selection of the neuro tra neurotrauma critical care of the joint section of tumors. He was co-chair of the scientific program committee for the CNS 2002 annual meeting, and he was scientific program chairman for CNS in 2003 meeting. He was annual meeting chairman for CNS 2004 meeting. He's been the chair of the CNS International Committee and served on the CNS Publications Committee. He's on the board of directors of the Federation for International Education in Neurosurgery. He is chair of the Neuroendocrine Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. He has served as secretary and treasurer and president of the Georgia Neurological Society. Dr. Ioscu and his wife, Lola, have been married for 21 years. His wife is a RN with a specialty training in obstetrical nursing. And she's also a certified midwife. They've got three children. How lovely. Pituitary tumors and related neuroendocrine disorders are complex medical and surgical conditions that require significant expertise in diagnostic and therapeutic management. Optimal care of the pituitary patient is best provided in a multidisciplinary, collaborative environment that includes trained and experienced physicians in endocrinology, neurosurgery, diagnostic and inter interventional neuro neuroradiology, neuropathology, ENT surgery, radiation oncology, medical oncology, and neuropathology. The pituitary centers of excellence fulfill three key missions provide comprehensive, state-of-the-art care and support to patients with pituitary tumors. Provide training and continuing medical education in the management of pituitary and neuroendocrine disease for other physicians and the lay public, including patients and families. And contribute to basic and translational research in pituitary disorders. They are characterized by exemplary outcomes, quality, and patient satisfaction metrics. Yes, I hear you, Dr. Ioscu. Yes, sorry about the delay. I think we're live and ready to go. Wonderful. Thank you very much, and please welcome Dr. Ioscu. But it's not flickering at all, I no hope. More. No, no more no flickering. It looks good. <clears throat> okay, very good. Well, my apologies, and uh, good morning. Um, so we'll um, we, we'll go through everything. Um, even even if we are a little bit behind, I plan on on going through the whole uh, presentation, and uh, also having time to take questions. 
So the uh, topic we would consider, we will be considering this morning is uh, the issue of uh, pituitary centers of excellence and how that impacts um, patients, uh, their families and uh, caregivers. Uh, so first of all, a little overview, <clears throat> um, and I'd like to discuss just a few points here. Um, our general understanding of pituitary tumors, uh, how to optimize care, and what uh, constitutes a, a multidisciplinary approach. By that I mean the uh, talents and uh, input of uh, different specialists. So we will uh, first look at the understanding and caring for pituitary tumors as a broad group and then discussing the background and the rationale and structure of uh, pituitary centers of excellence. So the multidisciplinary approach really encompasses the skills and talents and input of uh, specialists such as endocrinologists who of course are the physicians charged with looking after the hormonal uh, systems. Uh, the neuro-ophthalmologist who uh, cater for vision, uh, primarily uh, because uh, the pituitary gland and pituitary tumors are in close uh, proximity to uh, nerves that go to the eye for vision and nerves that go to the eye to move the eye uh, in different directions of gaze. Uh, also part of this multidisciplinary team are the uh, neuroradiologists, i.e. the physicians who uh, um, interpret studies such as MRI scans and angiograms and CT scans and so forth. The neuropathologists who are charged with looking at the slides and determining what type of uh, tumor uh, has been removed. Uh, the radiation oncologists for those patients who require radiotherapy or, or, or stereotactic radiosurgery. And then the otolaryngologist or the ENT physicians uh, who um, look after um, the patient from the standpoint of the surgical approach and then post-surgical care for the nose and sphenoid sinus, which, which are the main passageway by which um, these tumors are treated surgically. <clears throat> the pituitary gland um, uh, sits at a very strategic uh, location. It literally is in the middle of the head. Um, I usually tell patients that it's between your eyes, halfway between your eyes, behind your nose, and almost as far back as your air, and it sits at the base of the brain. And that tells you um, where it is sort of in relation to the head. Now within the location where the gland sits in this area called the pituitary fossa, F-O-S-S-A, or the cella, S-E-L-L-A, is surrounded by uh, critical uh, structures. Just above the gland are the optic nerves and the chiasm. As I said before, these nerves go to the eyes and send uh, messages back to the brain about the visual system, what the eye is seeing. Right immediately on either side of the pituitary gland are the uh, carotid arteries, and the carotid arteries supply the brain directly with blood at very high pressure and velocity, and these are critical for the ongoing supply of blood to the brain. Immediately behind the pituitary also lies another major blood vessel called the basilar artery, which also supplies the brain with blood. So on three sides, the pituitary gland is bounded by uh, major blood vessels that supply the brain with blood. Surrounding the carotid artery itself and juxtaposed right next to the pituitary gland are the cavernous sinuses, which carry uh, blood, venous blood, from the pituitary gland and the brain. And within that uh, cavernous sinus is um, uh, three uh, major nerves that move the eye, the third, the fourth, and the sixth nerve, and then another nerve called the fifth nerve that supplies the face with uh, sensation. And just beyond the nerves to the eye, again on either side of the pituitary lie, the temporal lobes, which are part of the brain that are important in memory, speech, language, and above the uh, the optic nerves and the and, uh, above the gland is the frontal lobe of the brain which is also very critical. So you can immediately see that the only part of the uh, pituitary that's really not um, surrounded by critical structures is the bottom part which is where the bone is and that's the route through which we get there. So hopefully you got a sense uh, on that diagram at the top left hand corner here uh, for those structures, and I'll just sort of go the, through them. The one in red is the carotid artery. Um, this is the pituitary gland, and then the optic nerves above. This is the frontal lobe of the brain, which I was referring to. 
the temporal lobe of the brain on either side, and these yellow structures are the nerves that go to supply the eyes for movement and the face for sensation. So really nothing around the pituitary is really expendable, and so uh, cr very critical in terms of surgical approach to avoid um, injury to any of these vital structures. Now, the pituitary gland is in the business of making hormones and regulating the functions of the body uh, as a result of those hormones. And in this diagram, you can see um, that this is the part of the brain where the pituitary gland is immediately at attached to at the base of the brain called the hypothalamus. The pituitary gland has two components to it. It has something called the anterior pituitary and then the posterior pituitary. And they're sort of divided by tiny separation of cleft right here. The anterior pituitary uh, basically manufactures the critical hormones that regulate metabolism of the thyroid gland, um, the thyroid stimulating hormone, the adrenal gland, the ACTH or the adrenocorticotropic hormone, growth hormone, and then the LSH and FSH which regulate the uh, uh, functions of the gonads and assist in producing uh, hormones uh, to the gonads which regulate fertility, uh, sexual function, and so forth. Now this is a wider um, um, diagram um, to complement the one I just showed you which shows on the right hand side the base of the brain, the pituitary gland, the pituitary stalk to which is attached to and these hormones of the pituitary gland, TSH regulating thyroid function, ACTH regulating the adrenal, which are steroid hormones that regulate blood pressure, blood sugar, FSH and LH which regulate the gonads and allow you to produce testosterone for males uh, and females and estrogen and progesterone for females in particular. Growth hormone regulates growth for the entire body and prolactin regulates the breast milk production as well as um, the uh, menstrual uh, cycles. And endorphins uh, also uh, play a role in the function of the uh, hormonal production. The posterior lobe, which is the back end of the pituitary, produces two vital hormones, one called ADH or the antidiuretic hormone, and the antidiuretic hormone basically regulates water balance. It allows you to hold on to fluids like water so that um, you, your water balance is well regulated. And then another hormone called oxytocin which regulates the uterine muscles during labor and the breast milk production uh, during the postpartum period when uh, a mother is breastfeeding her baby. <clears throat> The functions of the pituitary gland, as you might now expect, are confined to growth, sexual function, uh, fertility, uh, blood pressure, glucose metabolism, blood sugar regulation, blood temperature regulation, and then the general metabolic well-being of the patient. And it also allows you to respond to stress and acute illness through the production of uh, steroids and, as we already saw, breast milk production and uh, regulation of labor. Now, the symptoms of pituitary dysfunction are very important to be aware of because uh, not being aware of these, these uh, symptoms uh, leads, uh, in many cases, to delay in diagnosis. In fact, uh, in, in patients with uh, um, disorders such as Cushing's disease and acromegaly, it's been um, well studied and established that on average, it's about eight, sometimes as much as nine years before a patient comes to medical attention uh, and has a uh, diagnosis. Uh, in the years preceding that, obviously the patients have symptoms, but unfortunately nobody's able to put all these symptoms together to uh, make the diagnosis. And the reason for that is, as you see on this list, um, these symptoms can be mistaken for, for many other types of things. For example, the patient may complain of weakness or fatigue. Uh, they may be gaining weight, and as you know, weight gain is very pop common in our, uh, in our, in our uh, population, and so it, uh, it might be thought to be due to something else, or weight loss, um, um, changes in appetite, changes in the skin, or fertility, or sexual function, which could also be 
mistaken for other things. Um, in cases such as Cushing's or acromegaly, there's usually a change in facial appearance. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of Cushing's, obviously the face becomes round and, and chunky, and in acromegaly, the, the tongue, the cheeks, um, the forehead, and the teeth usually bear the brunt of the changes in the face. Uh, breast discharge uh, uh, can also occur in patients with prolactin secreting uh, uh, tumors. Uh, and uh, weird symptoms such as apathy, depression, anxiety, which of course afflict a large portion of the population can also occur. Uh, and again, people might not uh, associate this, even physicians that uh, are in other specialties might not associate this with the pituitary um, and think of other, other po po uh, uh, potential diagnoses. Um, <clears throat> even odd things such as changes in memory and attention and focus can also be uh, symptoms of pituitary dysfunction. And then uh, abnormal growth in the case of growth hormone tumors causing acromegaly or gigantism in children uh, uh, and uh, abnormalities in, in metabolism. So you can see uh, through this uh, uh, list of uh, <clears throat> symptoms which is by no means exhaustive that uh, symptoms of pituitary dysfunction can uh, literally run the, the gamut uh, of, of uh, psych psychiatry, um, GYN, obstetrics, um, internal medicine, dental, uh, and, and, and just literally the, the, the gamut of, of medicine. So it behooves physicians um, to be aware of this, which um, is uh, uh, yet another reason why um, centers that focus on pituitary disorders are absolutely vital and critical for the care of uh, pituitary patients and their families. Now, <clears throat> um, most people who first get the diagnosis of a pituitary adenoma or pituitary tumor are, uh, are obviously frightened. They don't know what that means. Sometimes they don't even know where the pituitary is. They're not sure whether this is uh, something treatable. And I, I usually tell the patients, I say, well, for the first uh, the first thing about this is that there's some um, good news um, in that these tumors are almost always benign. In other words, they're not cancerous, as in, say, breast cancer or lung cancer. We can spread all over your body and cause uh, havoc uh, even remote from the site. Pituitary tumors tend to remain in the pituitary or the surrounding areas around the pituitary, which you have seen are critical structures. Uh, themselves, but the, they never spread outside into somewhere else in the body, um, which also means that they're almost never malignant. Um, they, it is very, very rare that there is a malignant pituitary tumors. Not that they do not occur, but they, they're, they're very unusual. Um, they're broadly defined as two groups. Uh, one are secretory, in other words, they produce or overproduce uh, the normal pituitary hormones. For example, too much steroids or too much thyroid or too much prolactin which can cause these kinds of symptoms we talked about. On the converse, um, they may be non-secretory. In other words, the tumor has gotten so large and has compromised the function of the normal gland. Uh, whereas the tumor itself is not producing hormones, it impedes the uh, ability of the gland itself to produce hormones. And so the patient becomes effectively deficient in hormones and they may come in uh, complaining of symptoms related to deficiency of hormones. Adenomas, uh, pituitary adenomas, which is the medical term for them, may be small, in other words, so small that um, they may not even be visible on MRI scans, or they may be so large, the so-called giant tumors, which are um, many centimeters in size. Um, sometimes they're discovered what uh, as we, we call it incidentally. Uh, in other words, someone has undergone a scan or an, um, such as an MRI scan or a CT scan for something that was not related to um, the, the, the tumor itself. Uh, maybe they fell and bumped their head or were involved in a car accident or something and the uh, MRI scan was obtained as part of, uh, of the evaluation of that event and then lo and behold, uh, a tumor is found. In fact, uh, that is not an unusual situation at all, and it has been, um, it's been quite studied, and somewhere around 15%, maybe as high as 16%, one in six 
patients may actually harbor a pituitary adenoma unbeknownst to them, and that uh, discovery is only then made uh, when the patient um, undergoes this imaging for some other reason. We've um, also learned that they can cause problems uh, from pressure on the surrounding uh, structures, things that surround the pituitary gland, uh, most important of which is um, the, um, the optic nerve that goes to supply the eye with vision. And the typical presentation is that the patient complains of problems with peripheral vision uh, or blurring of vision. They may be bumping into things on the side or have troubles with driving. <clears throat> The good news, again, as I said, uh, is that these tumors can be removed in the majority of instances with the restoration not only of such things as visual uh, problems, or, but also hormonal function. And surgical removal can, ab can absolutely re restore the no normal uh, hormonal production, whether it was being overproduced, as in Cushing's disease or acromegaly or prolactinomas, or underproduced, as in the non-functioning tumors which have caused compromise to the normal gland by causing pressure on the normal gland. Now, um, continuing our voyage down the, um, the overview, um, how, is, how is the surgery uh, performed? Uh, what, what, what does it take to, 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 to remove these tumors? Um, and uh, it turns out that most uh, of these tumors can be removed through an operation uh, through the nose, uh, and the medical term for that is an endonasal, which basically means inside uh, and through the nose. Uh, transphenoidal, in other words, going through a, a sinus known as the sphenoid sinus, and if you look at this diagram, which is a side view illustration, you can see the tip of the nose right here, and the uh, upper teeth, and the palate, and this is the nose, this is the septum, and of course this up here is the brain. And this little cavity behind the nose is called the sphenoid sinus, and it's filled with air. Um, and there are lots of these sinuses in the head, and they effectively make your bone lighter uh, because if all the bone was solid, your head would be our heads would be much heavier. So the surgeon goes through the nose and gets to the back end of the nose here, where there's a little tiny plate of bone uh, in front of this air cell called the sphenoid sinus. The surgeon takes that bone away and gets into the floor the bottom or the base of the, of, the, of the skull right here, which is where the pituitary gland sits and is able to uh, operate in that very small area, which may be only about uh, a centimeter and a half, which is about just a little over um, uh, an, um, um, half an inch, because if you, if you do the math, 2.5 centimeters is an inch, so a little over a centimeter and a half, or just about, is just under uh, or at uh, uh, half an inch, so it's a really tiny space. Um, and using special techniques um, um, such as an endoscope, which allows you to see deep inside using light and magnification, um, that the surgeon can then operate in a very tiny space using uh, uh, in, uh, instrumentation, which you will see in a little bit, and get into the pituitary fossa where the pituitary tumor sits uh, at the base of the brain. Again, being very mindful, uh, if you look at this picture, being mindful, right above you is the optic nerves, the carotid artery, uh, right about here. So the surgeon's operating right in here uh, to remove that tumor. Um, on very rare occasions, uh, if the tumor is very large, uh, in, in some instances it may be necessary to go from the top of the skull uh, to reach the tumor. Uh, again, that is um, uncommon uh, nowadays. Now, uh, patients are f um, have to be selected uh, for the surgery based on certain criteria. Um, obviously, the primary criteria first is that there is a tumor causing symptoms. Uh, we want to know what the size of the tumor is, and so the doctor may have ordered or, or, uh, an MRI scan or a CT scan for patients who are unable to undergo imaging with an MRI scan. The MRI scan magnetic resonance imaging study is the state of the art uh, way of uh, identifying and uh, seeing those tumors, uh, and it can, it can identify very small tumors all the way to very large tumors. Uh, the configuration or the shape of the tumor is very important. Uh, tumors that are uh, round and are, are confined within the uh, pituitary uh, are usually amenable to uh, surgery through that transnodal route, whereas uh, tumors that are bigger and, uh, and uh, occupy 
uh, large amounts of space underneath the brain uh, or around the carotid artery may require uh, other approaches. The goal, the goal of surgery is to remove the tumor, uh, remove uh, the pressure of the tumor on the surrounding structures, particularly uh, in the, the visual structures which may be causing problems with vision or the normal pituitary gland, correcting any hormonal deficiencies uh, or overproduction uh, which the tumor may be causing. The tumor type is also very important in determining whether or not surgery is performed because there are other ways of treating these tumors uh, using medical means. For example, if the tumor is a prolactin secreting tumor, that, uh, that tumor in particular is amenable to medical management uh, taking a pill uh, once or twice or three times a day or once or twice a week. Um, um, and those patients uh, in that category, the prolactin secreting tumor, can get a cure <clears throat> of their overproduction by continuing to take that medicine uh, as prescribed by the, the, the physician. Um, um, patients with Cushing's, for example, are best treated by surgery since the uh, medical treatment for Cushing's is not anywhere uh, as good as, for example, in the case of uh, prolactin secreting tumors. Growth hormone tumors uh, have um, medical therapies that are available that can be given by shots uh, um, in the muscle or subcutaneously uh, in addition to um, uh, surgery. Uh, very important uh, p um, is also the case of whether or not the patient has undergone previous surgery or previous radiation or previous treatment. Uh, that is also very important in trying to decide what uh, the appropriate uh, treatment is. And if the patient's had any prior surgery, uh, once, twice, where was the surgery done, how was it done, these are all very important pieces of the um, discussion that needs to be held uh, in a multidisciplinary manner at a pituitary center where there are physicians uh, with various skill sets, the endocrinologist, the radiation oncologist, the neurosurgeon, the ENT surgeon, and, and the neuropathologist. Now, um, this is a little um, montage of things that, um, how things look like in the operating room, um, um, which uh, I know a lot of patients do not have the advantage of seeing, um, but um, in this day and age with uh, the internet and so forth, it's pretty um, easy to find uh, some of this information uh, by yourselves. So in the middle of the, of the, of the picture here is an MRI scan which shows part of the brain and a very large tumor here, a giant tumor which is about four and a half centimeters, so just closing in on about uh, two inches in diameter and you can see here that it's exerting pressure on the optic nerves and this is before surgery and of course this is the same uh, patient after surgery. You can see now where you didn't see before the optic nerves and then this is the gland which obviously could not be seen there because it was occupied, um, the space was occupied by the tumor and this is where the tumor used to be and you can see. Um, I've put in here two techniques for removing these tumors. On the one hand, on the top left hand corner, uh, this is a patient in surgery obviously covered in drapes um, and this is a microscope which is draped in this poly, polyvinyl uh, uh, sterile uh, jacket and um, uh, operating uh, myself operating here, uh, removing the tumor using a microscope. This is also uh, my operating room here uh, uh, at Emory and this is a patient under the, uh, the drapes here and in this particular uh, case we're operating using what's called an endoscope and in particular what's called a 3D or three-dimensional endoscope and this is the monitor here with the, with the surgical field and you can see wearing, uh, we're wearing these uh, 3D uh, goggles. Um, on the top uh, the, the middle uh, montage here on the right hand side are the endoscopes. These are the tools that are uh, used um, in, in part of the, uh, in the surgical uh, portion of the uh, procedure um, to look inside the nose and you can see it's a small round long tube allows you to get directly inside the nose and it has light at the end of the, uh, the, the shaft and uh, also magnification and this is the typical position of, uh, of a patient. So hopefully that gives you some flavor for what's, what goes on in, inside of the surgical suite. 
Now this is um, um, an array of instrumentation here uh, that is typically in a surgical pan that shows you the kinds of tools that are used to remove the tumor. Fortunately, many of these tumors, not all, but many of them are soft and can be removed with these instruments called uh, curettes. These are soft instruments that uh, allow the tumor to be piecemeal removed and then um, um, uh, delivered. Some tumors cannot be completely removed. They may grow sideways into the cavernous sinus as we talked about and because of the important nerves and the blood vessels in this area, it may be necessary sometimes to leave um, a piece of the tumor there behind uh, so that um, um, injury to those areas is not sustained uh, because those, those, those structures are extraordinarily critical and uh, must not be uh, perturbed in any way. Um, in, the, in cases of very large tumors, um, the, the surgeon may sometimes elect uh, and recommend to stage, in other words, separate the two surgeries um, in time so that a portion of the remove is removed uh, at one stage and the second portion at another stage, or uh, to have medical treatment at the first stage followed by surgical treatment at the second stage, or vice versa, surgery at the first stage followed by medical therapy or surgery followed by medical therapy and radio surgery in those cases where um, the patient may require complex multi-dimensional uh, uh, treatment. And again, this is um, the, the kind of approach that you, you, you have in a situation where there's a center of excellence where the, the virtues and the, and the um, skills of various um, um, specialists are brought to bear. Now, some key points about surgery, medical care, and radio surgery. Um, the cert success of whether it's the surgery or the medical care uh, or the radiosurgical care depends really on the skill, the experience, and the volume of the surgeons and the physicians performing these uh, procedures, which is why um, in centers where there's a large volume of uh, and there's a regional presence, um, those, those, those uh, centers are able to provide that type of skill set and that experience uh, uh, spanning decades and the kind of volume uh, that allows you to build expertise and, um, and a track record of excellence in patient outcomes and, um, and uh, satisfaction. In general, the, um, and like in most things in life, uh, the more experienced you are, all other things being equal, the experienced surgeons generally have the highest rates of cure. Uh, and the rate of complications in, in tandem is also typically lowest amongst those centers and those um, surgeons that have the, the most experience. And in many of these uh, major centers, uh, surgeons uh, operate on these tumors, uh, several of them uh, week in, uh, week out. So now let's go into what uh, um, the overview, what you should look for, whether you're a patient or a, a, a caregiver or a spouse or or family member uh, following this, uh, the diagnosis being made, uh, whether it's by being made by your uh, local GP or internist or GYN or endocrinologist. Uh, now the next step is, okay, having made the diagnosis, um, you've had some blood tests maybe, maybe you've had one MRI or a CT scan, and you're trying to make a decision as to what to do next or uh, in conjunction with your physicians and, and family. What you want to look for is a comprehensive, comprehensive meaning all in, you know, one place where you can go for one-stop shopping for the surgery, the medical management, the radio surgery or the radiation management if you need it, the social uh, part of, of the care and uh, the psychiatric part of the care if there are those uh, symptoms as well and uh, just a holistic, uh, comprehensive state of the art. State of the art meaning there's nothing that is available, that is uh, uh, considered a standard of care uh, that is not available at that center. Uh, so that all those things are there uh, from imaging to ophthalmology to endocrinology to radiosurgery to anesthesiology, etc. And so um, you can have a comprehensive, all-in, state-of-the-art, avant-garde, um, best of the best uh, uh, care and support. Um, Typically, those same centers are, are usually involved in the training uh, and continuing medical education um, of, of pituitary disease, not just for, for 
themselves and uh, fellow physicians, but also the public. So the patient support groups are available, um, patient seminars uh, and uh, available, and uh, uh, internet uh, is used to help educate um, uh, and provide videos. Uh, um, if if uh, you, you need to demonstrate PowerPoint presentations to uh, follow, demonstrate literature uh, and and so forth. And typically, these centers themselves are producing these uh, these types of uh, materials for dissemination to other physicians and the public as well. And then the third feature is that they're usually involved in clinical or basic science research uh, trials, perhaps new drugs, new devices, etc. Um, that are available for uh, the more difficult cases, if you will, where the routine standards uh, of care may not be um, insufficient to address very complex um, 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 uh, treatment um, situations. Uh, the goal of these uh, centers is obviously to have outcomes that are ex exemplary, in other words, that are better than the best of the best, uh, and the quality uh, metrics and the patient satisfaction metrics should also be of a, a exceptionally high standard, and that, hence the reason uh, why they, they, they go by the Appalachian Center of Excellence. Most of these are regional in, in their footprints, uh, and there usually will be one near uh, or at or a major medical uh, center, uh, and uh, comprising this uh, team-oriented, multidisciplinary uh, approach. And there's no question but that these are extraordinarily beneficial not just for patients, but elevated standards uh, in the general medical um, environment where they, they are. So just to redefine and uh, rehash again, a, a center of excellence is a cohesive team, you know, in other words, that work together uh, and uh, mutually support each other and the patients and the families that provide, promote collaboration, work together, and apply the best practices uh, as they exist around this specific focus area of pituitary disease to improve uh, results, uh, in other words, the best surgical results and outcomes. Um, pituitary tumors are not the only uh, disease entity, of course, that have centers of excellence. Uh, the, the, the first uh, national center of excellence in women's health was established in 1996 by the um, U.S. Uh, Department of Health. Uh, there are other centers in, uh, of excellence in transplant surgery, bariatric surgery, trauma centers, and stroke centers, and so forth. So this is the sort of thing that you need to be on the lookout for. Uh, now, I did mention the internet uh, a little a little bit ago, and whilst the internet is uh, extraordinarily been extraordinarily helpful for the dissemination and the retrieval of information, um, the internet also is it is not policed, and uh, you have to be very careful about what you see uh, and and be extraordinarily uh, skeptical. Uh, make sure you, you check things uh, yourself. For example, if you put in the search term pituitary center of excellence you, uh, in the Google search engine, you, you, you're going to get somewhere in the range of about 61,000 results. Well, we all know that they're not 61,000 centers of excellence, not in the United States and certainly not in, in the world. Uh, that is an extraordinary large number of centers of excellence, but it is the kind of thing that you have to be careful about because these are self-designated uh, without any specific criteria or certification process. And so it's uh, extraordinarily important to check things uh, with, with your, your local physicians um, and make sure that, um, um, that you get a second opinion or a third opinion if necessary uh, to verify what you're seeing and make sure that you're going to the right place uh, and you're going to be receiving the best care um, that's available. Now, um, this is an interesting slide because um, uh, most people think that pituitary tumors are, are rare, but, uh, and, and that, in, in, in a sense, is, has some merit to it. But more contemporary studies now indicate that they are far more common than previously thought, and recent population-based studies uh, are even uh, uh, looking at uh, prevalence uh, um, rates, in other words, the number of cases per uh, 100,000 of population, uh, somewhere in the range of one in, in six, and, and so that is much higher than, uh, than, than folks have uh, traditionally uh, thought uh, to represent. There's no question that many of these um, uh, 
disorders are still uh, unusual because most people, uh, most physicians, that is the garden variety physician, may not see one of these cases uh, on a regular basis, let alone in their career lifetime. So that uh, yet another reason why um, regionalization or coalescence of these uh, cases into the centers that are uh, that excel and have the the uh, the infrastructure uh, to mount the kind of, of care that is required for these rare and unusual diseases is 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 done. Uh, there's a lot of work being done. I know by the PNA to raise awareness uh, within the medical community and the public um, about the impact of pituitary tumors, and that uh, obviously is work that continues to uh, uh, be 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 done uh, because uh, it does take for take take time for the new um, the studies and the the information to percolate uh, through the um, the public. Um, now the th three um, <clears throat> three major reasons the ra that underpin the rationale are for the centers of excellence in pituitary tumors are expressed here in this slide. First of all, um, as I said uh, earlier, these are uh, unusual and rare uh, diseases uh, for most people who are not going to see them uh, in their lifetimes, um, uh, and therefore putting them all together in one place is, is exceedingly important. Uh, for the experience that, that comes of it and the advantages of that. But also because the field is advancing rapidly in terms of surgery, the advances in endoscopy recently, uh, the advances in image guidance that allow you to see and be more safe in terms of surgery, advances in radio surgery that allow pinpoint uh, radiation to be given rather than the old way where it was less discriminatory and so you had problems with radiation. Whereas with radio surgery, because of the more focused uh, nature of radio surgery, it's more, um, more, much more safer. The advances in endocrinology, new drugs coming into the pipeline, new drugs for Cushing's, new drugs for acromegaly, and a better understanding of the role of medical treatment uh, in these in these patients um, is yet another ra reason uh, for these centers. And then uh, imaging has also advanced rapidly, the, uh, particularly with the, with the rise of uh, the MRI scans and the contrast studies that, that that has enabled and the high field strength MRI scans, the intraoperative MRI scans uh, to guide surgery, and then image guidance that allows the surgeon to, um, to uh, uh, execute surgery more safely. Uh, using tools that allow you to locate vital structures such as the carotid so that you can avoid them from uh, from being injured in the uh, in the uh, the procedure these are all very very important advances that again are best uh, are, are, are usually found in these centers that have a range of state of the art facilities and then the outcomes and experience uh, as as I said before there's been many studies on the volume outcome relationship showing that the more uh, uh, more experience and the, the better the training um, and, uh, of the of the physicians, uh, the better the likelihood of optimal or excellent outcomes. Um, and whilst it's true that transmural surgery is available at many uh, at many of the major medical centers, um, even many of the medi ma major medical centers may not have sufficient numbers. Uh, like uh, you might find at the uh, centers of excellence in pituitary surgery. So the centers of excellence in pituitary surgery tend to have um, uh, larger volumes, so it allows for uh, more ability to uh, to train a larger group of uh, of, of uh, fellows and, and residents, uh, so that they they themselves become competent and expert in these in this field. <clears throat> So in terms of our mission uh, for the Pituitary Center of Excellence, I've su summarized it in here and it will be available. I'm not going to read it all uh, in every last detail, but just the highlights. First of all, and most important, the provi to provide superior patient care for patients with pituitary disorders. And that means that the institution has to be committed to this area of, of medicine. Um, they have sufficient experience and volume, a designated medical director, an established neurosurgeon with uh, the track record, an established endocrinologist with that track record in patient care, 
uh, the ability for them to co collect their prospective data, document their outcomes and complications, standard operating procedures and clinical pathways that allow the, um, the um, routine care of patients to proceed unencumbered, and then the nursing staff and then the patient support group and the community outreach to educate other physicians in their catchment area. Second, uh, the provision of education and training, both to nurses, other physicians, um, patient support groups, and uh, residency and fellowship training for those for the generation uh, behind. And then the advancement of the field uh, through clinical basic research, quality and outcome studies, and clinical trials. And for those who are interested, um, the reference to this uh, published in Neurosurgery at the bottom of the, of the page there, um, pituitary centers of excellence, uh, so that that's a, and that that's available uh, um, by download uh, on that the website of neurosurgery. So, in conclusion, um, um, there's an abundance of data uh, that the the optimal management of the pituitary patient really requires the coordinated, multidisciplinary approach by experienced uh, uh, specialists. Uh, who have a focused interest in this particular disorders, and those are best found at these centers of excellence that help achieve that goal by enhancing patient care, um, public awareness, promoting training and expertise, and the advancement of uh, research in the management and, uh, and care and support of uh, patients with pituitary tumors and their families. And um, I'll be happy to take any questions, uh, and it's, I, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, sharing with you uh, some of these thoughts, and I'm sure that uh, some of you may have questions and comments, and I'll be delighted to uh, uh, entertain a discussion on, on those topics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayascu, very much. In spite of our delays, uh, this was a wonderful presentation. Um, we had several people who have questions, and I will field those to you at the present time. We have a, uh, a male who is in early 50s and writes extensively, but the bottom line question is that, um, that he has uh, tried to decrease the cordif that, that he was placed on, um, but unable to do so because symptoms keep worsening each time. And um, uh, with the hydrocortisone, he got weaker, headaches, sore muscles, back pain, very fatigue, went back up to a dose of 30 uh, milligrams, um, and he was informed that it needs to be around 15 milligrams. He's tried to taper off. Is there anything that helps when trying to wean off the uh, 30 milligram dose, and this is again for a, uh, he was diagnosed uh, just last year actually for, uh, and had transphenoidal surgery for a prolactin uh, pituitary macroadenoma. Yes, um, that's a, <clears throat> an, interesting, um, an interesting question and, not one, and one that um, we not in frequently will encounter. Um, obviously, cortisol is uh, absolutely vital for, for metabolism and he cannot do without it. I don't know if he's totally deficient or not. It sounds like he may not be totally deficient, but he requires some um, and um, obviously cannot do with, without because then he has other problems. But in, 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 um, in reference to your question as to what helps when you're trying to taper, um, obviously when you're trying to taper um, the, 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 the dose of Cortev, you don't want any, anything to occur that may then require your body to need more cortisol. So during the time when you're tapering, you obviously need to be in the best of health because stress, uh, other illnesses um, will, will lead your body to ask for more cortisol, if you will, um, because the, 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 um, the metabolism needs to be um, boosted at the times of stress and times of other illnesses uh, and, and so forth. So that's one thing. So at the point when he's obviously trying to taper off is not the time when he needs to be ill or stressed out or requiring more, more drugs. So that's one way of, of trying to make it a little bit more uh, su successful. And um, and obviously other medications that might interfere with the with um, the delivery of cortisol, uh, things that need to be examined by the the physician uh, um, taking care of 
that uh, that 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 uh, weaning or cu cutting back on the on the cortex. So th those are two things that um, that may may um, may be worth um, uh, discussing or uh, e um, examining um, with his physician. Um, I don't know that that is going to solve the problem entirely because I don't know all the circumstances of the case, but off the top of my head, those are th two things that might be worth um, at least uh, pursuing. Thank you very much, Doctor. Very interesting, uh, the idea about particularly trying to maintain as less stress as possible. Um, obviously is something that I would be interested in as a mental health person. So, right. um, We have another question of someone who was diagnosed with a prolactin secreting tumor and prescribed medication and kind of wanting to know if this is going to be something she or he is going to have to take for the rest of their life or are there other ways that might shrink the tumor permanently without surgery? Yes, um, so this is um, one question that uh, again is, ex, um, is 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 asked quite a lot, um, the um, and I'm assuming that this particular patient um, um, at the time they were placed on the medication, this was the best uh, option uh, that uh, was there for them, um, so that there wasn't another option that was uh, that was equally as good or, or something, so that they, the, the, the election was made to go ahead with the medical therapy, which is for the most, for most patients the first line of treatment. Um, when these drugs uh, were originally designed, they were not designed to be uh, tumor killing drugs, and by that I mean two cells that are exposed to this drug don't typically just die and, and stop working and, and go away. Um, they um, typically suppress the growth of the tumor and also produce reduction in the amount of prolactin that's made and released. Um, more lately, there's been some data uh, um, coming through that um, that uh, is telling us that uh, in some of these um, with some of these drugs on these on these tumors that there may be some cell killing going on. Um, how much and for how long? is still an open question. Uh, there's some clinical studies, very small um, clinical studies out there, few patients where um, the medication has been stopped uh, for a few years and, uh, and then uh, the patient then followed uh, thereafter to see whether or not the tumor has grown and in, in some of these cases, few of them, um, the tumor has remained um, suppressed or has not grown. But at that, aside from those, those, those issues, most physicians still uh, recommend that the patient stay on the medicine indefinitely, at least until we discover something new maybe down the line. Uh, and most patients um, should be advised that that is the default, the default route for most patients is, the, is, is being uh, comfortable and being aware of the fact that uh, uh, long-term, by that I mean indefinite, uh, treatment of, uh, with those uh, prolactin, um, uh, prolactinoma uh, drugs such as bromocryptine or carbergoline. Um, aside from those two drugs that, uh, that are used and, as I said, have some, there's some evidence now of some cell killing associated with it, I'm not aware of any prolactinoma specific drugs that are out there that could be used to shrink the tumor permanently other than those two. And indeed, um, 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 if they were to exist, then we would all know about them in a hurry. But I'm not aware of any other drugs. The only other way uh, uh, um, to, to, uh, to consider would be a surgical removal of the tumor if it, were, if it were feasible, if it wasn't the kind of tumor that was invasive, in other words, had spread into areas where the surgeon could not get at it safely or in, in some cases where the tumor is very confined as well and, can, uh, and is of a small enough size, radiosurgery has also been used in those cases to uh, induce permanent, uh, permanent uh, suppression of hormone production and permanent uh, 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 um, suppression of growth of the tumor. So, uh, so there's the medical treatment, surgical and radiosurgical, those are the, uh, the three. And, up until now, as I said, uh, most people ad advise that they should be comfortable and uh, counseled to uh, prepare for um, 
long-term treatment with medication. And if they're going to withdraw the medication, it should be done under very close supervision of their physicians with MRI and blood biochemical um, analysis to, to follow the prolactin levels. Thank you, Doctor. And it also speaks to the topic about the center of ex centers of excellence because you have the availability of being able to look at the issue from multiple perspectives and uh, rather than just going to one doctor who has only one technique available, um, just, just seems to highlight what you've already spoken about today. So thank you. Um, doctor, you, uh, I have a question. Um, in your bio, it talks about that you've developed a new modality for imaging and targeting therapy for pituitary tumors. And one of the things in my studies I've learned that MRI is unfortunately not perfect and will pick up many of the tumors, but sometimes misses tumors. What are you working on in terms of imaging that might speak to that? Yes, interesting. Um, as, <clears throat> as you um, just uh, stated, the MRI scan um, is uh, good for resolving or finding, identifying uh, these tumors um, in the majority of cases. Um, in, the, the, in tumors such as Cushing's disease, for example, somewhere in the range of maybe as, as little as 20%, maybe to as high as 30 or even 40%, depending on which case series you look at, may not be identifiable on MRI scan because they're just too small. An MRI needs to be of sufficient, uh, a tumor needs to be of sufficient size for it to be identifiable on um, uh, MRI imaging. Um, the, start, the, the work we are doing is, is based on what's called molecular imaging. Um, MRI is based on contrast imaging with a contrast, magnetic contrast dye called gadolinium. We're working on and have published on molecular imaging, which uh, let me explain uh, what that is. Um, the tumors that, um, pituitary tumors in general have receptors on them. In other words, the cell, if you imagine, is a spherical ball and it has a little um, probe on its surface um, that's a lock, if you will. And a key or a ligand, another molecule, can attach to that uh, lock uh, and, um, and then uh, cause this fu function to change in the cell. And that's how prolactin uh, drugs uh, work. In other words, the prolactinoma cell has this lock on its surface called a D2 receptor and then the drug, carbergaline or, uh, or bromocryptine, can attach to that lock and switch on some changes in that cell. Um, and same thing for growth hormone um, uh, tumors too. They have that lock called the somatostatin receptor. You have a somatulinate drug that locks onto that. And in, <clears throat> in early years, many, many years ago, decades ago, um, somatostatin receptors were used to image or molecular image um, um, uh, growth hormone tumors by uh, designing a, 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 a drug um, that had a, um, a, 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 um, an agent that allowed that tumor to light up. And that's the same thing what we've done with non-functioning tumors. We discovered that non-functioning tumors express a receptor called the folate receptor and that that receptor can be identified or imaged by designing a key that fits onto that receptor that's then attached to something called technetium-99, which if you then take a picture using what's called a gamma camera because the technetium-99 emits um, um, a signal that can be captured on a camera. So you can identify the receptor in those patients with non-functioning tumors. The reason why that's important is because you can also design a drug to that that receptor that rather than it send out a message or a, emits a signal that can be you can take a picture of, that drug can then attach to that cell and cause that cell to take in the drug and destroy that cell. So it, it, is, it is important not only in imaging this the tumor but can also be used to destroy the tumor and so this is something that we've been also working on um, in terms of our translational uh, and clinical research. So um, we actually have uh, that, that, that data is out there, published data, and you can actually see using this uh, technique uh, patients who have that receptor 
um, a priori before surgery, and it's a it's a it's a very neat way of identifying tumors that are within the gland or have crossed over the gland into the cavernous sinus that may not be easily picked up using other tools such as MRI scan. Well, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, uh, that, that really is the future and uh, some really cutting edge information. Uh, at this point in time, I think we'll probably need to bring our, our presentation to a close. I want to express my thanks on behalf of the PNA as well as all of our listeners to Dr. Ayescu for your time and for trying to struggle through our technical difficulties for today. I want to thank everyone who participated and uh, I was listening today as well as those who asked questions and uh, please keep your eyes open for future presentations. Keep in mind that this presentation will be located uh, in a few days. It takes us a few days to get it up on our website, uh, pituitary.org, and it will be available for a short period of time to the general public and then to our membership. So again, thank you so very much, and have a great April Fool's Day. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>